this on my computer. Okay, there we go. Um, so my name is Sean Redmiles. I'm the director of the Faulkner History Museum at the Old Jail. Uh, we just put in an exhibit in August of um, this, this August of 2020 that celebrates the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And we ended up sort of focusing specifically on the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia um, because they came to Fokker County, they gave speeches, uh, they formed committees and groups. Uh, so we really wanted to highlight that story. So if you come to the museum today, you will be able to see that exhibit and the objects that we have inside. Uh, but most of that information, um, you know, in terms of even just like the documents that we got, um, the evolution of the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia, all of that came from um, information we got from the Library of Virginia and especially uh, Barbara Batson, who is here today. So I one day was um, looking through her book. She is the co-author of the Campaign for Women's Suffrage in Virginia. It was in front of me for like the hundredth time uh, that month. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I could just ask um, them, to uh, Barbara, and see if she will come and speak for us and talk about this. And I did, and she amazingly graciously accepted, and I just can't believe it. So um, I'll talk a little bit about her. She is the exhibitions coordinator for the Library of Virginia. Um, she's been working at the Library of Virginia for 23 years. Um, she just told me earlier that she's been working in museums for a very long time. Didn't give me the number of years. I understand why. Um, but uh, but for, she's been doing this for a while, guys. So I'm um, very excited to have her. She got her degrees from White Forest University, the University of Virginia. And uh, she currently, she oversees a lot of exhibits, but one, one in particular that has to do with what we're talking about today is the We Demand Women's Suffrage in Virginia exhibition. And uh, she can tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, but they are open, and I think she uh, earlier just told me that you can go and see it on a limited basis. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Barbara, and uh, she'll tell you about herself and get started. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Sean, and good afternoon, and thank you to Sean for asking me to speak about this really wonderful project. And first, I want to recognize the incredible work that my colleagues Mary Julian and Brent Tarter did for the exhibition and for our book, the Campaign for Women's Suffrage in Virginia, available through the History Press. Mary and Brent did the deep dive, and I do mean a deep dive, into the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia records and confirmed what we had always suspected, that there was a great story that just needed to be told. They were my co-curators for the exhibition at the library, which is on view through May 28th of 2021. Next, please. There we go. <laughs> Suffrage amendments to the Virginia State Constitution had been introduced in 1912 and 1914, each time supported by about a dozen delegates. By 1916, lobbying by the Virginia, or excuse me, by the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia was having a noticeable effect. The Big Stone Gap Post reported that 40 delegates voted for a suffrage amendment, although 52 voted against. The reporter wrote that, quote, those who believe in the cause of women should take heart. It is moving along and the pace is by no means slow. When both houses of the U.S. Congress passed the Susan B. Anthony Amendment in June 1919, recognizing women's right to vote, most of the Virginia representatives and senators voted against it. Only one Virginia representative, C. Bascom Slimp, a Republican from Southwest Virginia voted for the amendment. Then it was up to the state legislatures. Virginia's suffragists from both the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia and the National Women's Party closely watched the progress. Would the federal amendment be ratified? Would their years of work succeed? The conventional story is that because the Virginia General Assembly refused to ratify the 19th Amendment during its 1920 session, that women's suffrage was a failure in Virginia. The assumption has been that there was no real interest in women's suffrage in the Commonwealth. Well, I'm here to tell you that's all wrong. In 1909, a group of women met in Richmond and organized the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia, an affiliate of the National, the National American Women's Suffrage Association. For a decade, these women lobbied, cajoled, rallied, spoke, wrote, and distributed tens, if not hundreds of thousands of leaflets for the cause of women's suffrage. 
led by Lalamede Valentine, and you see her in the oval, they stepped outside the roles expected of them as wives and mothers and organized an effective campaign of education and persuasion. Members of the Equal Suffrage League were white, middle and upper class women who were involved in other reform movements. They had leisure and money and African-American servants. And the Equal Suffrage League was also multi-generational. They had members who ranged in age from their early 20s into their 70s. Next. Under Valentine's leadership, the women of the Equal Suffrage League were well organized. Valentine, Jesse Townsend, Elizabeth Lewis, and others traveled throughout the Commonwealth to establish chapters, constantly reminding their fellow Virginians that if women could vote, they could reform labor laws and laws um, regulating health and education. Women in Warrington organized a chapter of the Equal Suffrage League in June 1913. And two years later, Valentine motored her way through Loudoun and Falkir counties, where she organized leagues at Purcellville, Waterford, The Plains, Middleburg, and Casanova. At a meeting in, War in Warrington during that period, artist Richard Norris Brooke spoke in favor of women's suffrage. And that evening, the Warrington League staged its first open air suffrage meeting. The Richmond Times Dispatch reported that, quote, the committee in charge of the meeting was composed of Mrs. R.K. Hillary, Mrs. Shirley Carter, Miss Gaskins, Mrs. John B. Grayson, Mrs. Marshall, Mrs. Appleton, and Mrs. Washington Nelson. Mrs. Valentine received an enthusiastic response to her plea for suffrage and many signatures to the petition to the General Assembly. The drummer boy in the band was converted to the cause and volunteered his services at the Casanova meeting next day. On Saturday morning, members of the committee from the Warrington League drove through town in an automobile gaily decorated with suffrage banners. They proceeded to Casanova, where they were met by a group of suffragists. The meeting was held at the Oak Grove near the station. The drummer boy drummed, and in a few moments, a crowd assembled. Following Mrs. Valentine's address, the Casanova League was formed. On the screen, you see most of the map showing the different uh, chapters of the Equal Suffrage League. By 1919, there were about 145 chapters of the ESL scattered throughout the Commonwealth. There were about 10 on the Eastern Shore, go figure. And there were chapters even in the far Southwest Virginia. They had a total membership of at least 20,000 and possibly as many as 30,000 women and men, making the Equal Suffrage League the largest non-military organization in Virginia at that time. Let me repeat that. By 1919, the Equal Suffrage League was the largest private organization in Virginia. Wow. That's really remarkable. Wow. Next slide. Suffragists held teas and spoke on street corners from automobiles and at YMCA's. Adele Clark, an artist, recalled that she would set up her easel at a street corner in Richmond, and as people gathered around to see what she was painting, she would engage them in conversation about woman suffrage. The Equal Suffrage League of Virginia had a booth at the State Fair in 1910, only a year after it had been founded, and decorated with posters that illustrated the need for woman suffrage. There were guest speakers, and by the time the fair ended, the women had thousands of signatures on nine petitions supporting women's suffrage. In 1911, the ESL prepared two booths at the fair, one for luncheon and one for literature. And I suspect that anyone who went to the luncheon booth probably heard about the cause and the need for women's suffrage. Mm. Suffragists printed handbills and postcards published pamphlets and newspapers and sold buttons, pins, ribbons, and other memorabilia on an unprecedented scale. Local leagues purchased many goods from the National American Woman Suffrage Association, but also used printers, local printers, to produce an astounding array of handbills that argued for women's suffrage, with titles such as Six Reasons Why Farmers' Wives Should Vote and What Every Woman Knows. 
Not all Virginia women, and most men, welcomed the idea of women's suffrage. Among the leaders of the Virginia Association opposed to women's suffrage were socially prominent women who, like their ESL counterparts, were involved in other reform movements. Curiously, their advisory board was all men. Hmm. The Virginia Association opposed to women's suffrage circulated pamphlets and broadsides that equated women's suffrage with socialism or argued that women's suffrage would destroy the home or they explained what the vote would not do. The vote would not raise wages. The vote could not stop the white slave traffic or prostitution or liquor trade. The vote would not build schoolhouses or clean streets or stop child labor. And besides, women had no business in politics. Jane M. Rutherford, president of the Virginia Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, pleaded with a potential male supporter for contributions to, quote, make every effort to keep the burden of government from being forced on an unwilling majority. We are at a disadvantage because the suffragists are well financed. <laughs> but the, for the members of the Virginia Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage and other opponents, the real threat was that granting women's suffrage but extend the vote to African-American women. The Virginia government had spent the last 20 years of the 19th century dismantling and disavowing any rights that African-Americans might claim. The 1902 Virginia state constitution had disfranchised as many as 90% of eligible African-American men and about 50% of poor white men in a blatant attempt to place the control of the Commonwealth in the hands of a small group of white men. The Equal Suffrage League argued that because white women outnumbered African-American women, the so-called Negro vote would be effectively nullified. For the national organization, downplaying the potential effect of the black vote was crucial to win over Southern legislators. Just in time for Woodrow Wilson's first inauguration as president of the United States, Alice Paul organized a march in Washington, D.C. in March 1913 that featured college women, writers, artists, working women, whole variety. Estimates were as, that as many as 5,000 women marched. More than 100 Virginia suffragists participated. The police provided little protection for the marchers, and some men spit on or near the women's skirts or tripped them up. Faith Morgan of Newport News recalled that she, quote, landed on the next out projected foot as hard as my 155 pounds would serve me. I could hear a plaintive voice behind me bleeding, she stepped on my foot, she stepped on my foot. The glow of my satisfaction is ever burning. The marchers were, an overwhelmingly, were overwhelmingly white. The National American Woman Associ Suffrage Association and later the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage did not encourage African Americans to join the organizations. Members of the newly organized Delta Sigma Theta sorority from Howard University marched in their academical robes, but at the end of the procession. Mary Church Terrell led a group from the National Association of Colored Women and Ida Wells Barnett boldly marched with the contingent from Illinois. Next. On March 1st, 1915, the Equal Suffrage League staged a rally at the state capitol. The Richmond Times Dispatch reported that, quote, floating suffrage banners, fluttering yellow ribbons, silver toned bugles, and a brass band proclaimed the fact that it was Equal Suffrage Day. Throughout the morning, 40 women at 11 stands about the city sold copies of the Woman's Journal and suffrage flags, buttons, and postcards. That afternoon, Rabbi Edward Nathan Kalish spoke forcefully in, for, in favor of women's suffrage. Most of Richmond's clergy, and in fact, most Southern clergy, refrained refrain from making any political statement about suffrage. Joy Montgomery Higgins, who was a guest speaker from Nebraska, made an excellent address. She said, quote, equal suffrage has gone beyond the joke stage. It can no longer be smiled away. A few years ago, men said women who were agitating for the vote, what are the dear ladies playing at now? Apparently they must have a fad. 
The year before last, it was Bridge Whist. Last year, it was the tango, and now it is votes for women. But, said Higgins, they overlooked one fact. Who were the dear ladies playing bridge with and tangoing with? Why men? And they'll be voting with men too. About six weeks after the Capitol rally, Sophie Meredith, a founding member of the Equal Suffrage League and several like-minded women, broke with the ESL and joined the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage established by Alice Paul. Unlike the Equal Suffrage League and the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which focused on passage of amendments to state constitutions, the Congressional Union turned its effort to a federal amendment to the U.S. Constitution that, if ratified, would override state voting laws. At the 1916 State Fair, the Congressional Union Virginia branch manned a booth of local members as well as Eva Mae Waters and Florence Muriel from the national headquarters, and that's Florence Muriel standing on the chair. Thanks to Sophie Meredith's great-granddaughter, the library now has the minute book for the Congressional Union Virginia branch kept by Marion Reed. We knew virtually nothing about this group until Sophie Meredith Sides Cowan donated the minute book, and what a revelation it has been. Like the Equal Suffrage League records, this minute book has been digitized and transcribed to make it keyword searchable, and it will be up uh, with the ESL records later this year and available through uh, the library's data management system. I wish I could tell you what the date would be, but I don't know. But anyway, it's awesome. Alice Paul and the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage adopt, adopted more aggressive but nonviolent tactics. Suffragists marching in parades were treated roughly by spectators and afforded little protection from the police force. In March 1917, and in time for Wilson's second inauguration as president, the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage organized the first, and I do mean the first, picket protest at the White House. The suffragists were arrested for obstructing traffic or causing a nuisance. Maud Jameson of Norfolk has the distinction of being the Virginian with the most arrest, perhaps as many as a dozen times. In August 1918, 37 women were arrested as they staged a protest in Lafayette Park, right across from the White House, as we all know. They were hauled to police headquarters and patrol wagons, released on their own recognizance, and promptly returned to Lafayette Park. They were arrested again. The Richmond Times Dispatch reported that one of the women, Matilda Hall Gardner, quote, asked her husband to ask the policeman in charge of her to be more gentle. Gardner did so and was arrested, charged with interfering with an officer. Alice Paul was a brilliant strategist who kept pressure on the U.S. Congress. In 1916, she sent 23 representatives from chapters in the eastern states for a 38-day tour to the western states whose legislatures had recognized women's right to vote. The purpose was to enlist western women's aid to support the federal suffrage amendment. Marion Reed of Highland Springs, and you see her in the little circle, represented the Virginia branch and compiled a scrapbook of her trip. Leaving Washington on April 9, the group traveled by train to, listen to this, Illinois, Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, Utah, and Missouri in 38 days. That's really remarkable. When she returned to Richmond, she was greeted by decorated cars and a fife and drum band and escorted to Capitol Square. In March 1917, the Congressional Union reorganized as the National Women's Party, and that is still its name, and redoubled its efforts to secure a federal amendment. Members of the National Women's Party Virginia branch generally were come here's, women who were educated outside of Virginia or the South, but whose husbands had settled in the Commonwealth. Pauline Adams was just such a woman. Born in Ireland and who came to the United States as a young girl with her parents, Adams and her husband and two sons lived in Norfolk, where she was a founding member of the Norfolk chapter of the Equal Suffrage League. In 1913, she marched in Washington, D.C. 
But by 1915, she had come to see a need for a more active and con confrontational or suffrage organization. So she joined the Congressional Union. She marched and picketed and was arrested. She served her time in the workhouse at Occoquan. In a letter to her husband, Adams wrote, quote, I have been kept from the privilege of incoming or outgoing mail for over the past week and am now locked in a small cell in solitary. I have not been given my toothbrush or hairbrush here yet, but got the loan of this pencil from a new picket who came with another group yesterday. In 1919, the National Woman's Party organized another national tour, this time of former prisoners, including Adams, to drum up support for the federal amendment then being debated in Congress. The former prisoners visited Charleston, South Carolina, Chattanooga, Jacksonville, New Orleans, San Antonio, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Denver, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, Syracuse, Boston, Hartford, and finally Washington. They had wanted to decorate their train with purple, white, and gold colors, and the train company wouldn't let them do that. But at each stop, the women dressed in reproductions of their prison clothes and demonstrated how they were treated and how they had to march in prison. They also gave speeches, and you see a photograph here of Lucy Burns in San Francisco, and actually Pauline is in the car. And there's even a newsreel footage of their San Francisco treat, a trip which is cool. Yeah. To track their success or failure to persuade legislators to support women's suffrage, the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia and the National Women's Party separately created a crude database using index cards for each legislature. In the ESL, it was members of the Virginia Senate and Virginia House of Delegates. The ESL cards noted the men's voting records and contained notes from the women who talked with the legislators. W.N. Tiffany Falkir was adamant in his opposition to women's suffrage. He voted against it in 1916 and in 1918, and he told Nora Houston that he, quote, wouldn't vote for suffrage until he changed his mind. Basically, leave me alone. He voted against the 18th Amendment that ushered in national prohibition, which is a clear indication that he brooked no federal interference with what he considered to be state affairs. On the other hand, Wilbur Hall, whose district included parts of Falkir and Loudoun counties, was reported as opposed, but then converted in 1918. When Elizabeth Lewis and Adele Clark with him talked, talked with him in 1919, they reported that he wants to vote yes. Well, they kept checking in with him and he was waffling. At one point they noted he was looking sheepish and they finally had to mark him down as doubtful. When the federal amendment came up for a vote on February 12, 1920, both houses of the Virginia, of the Virginia General Assembly rejected the amendment. But at that same session, the legislators hedged their bets. In the event the federal amendment was ratified, the legislators passed a machinery bill that allowed, quote, for the immediate and regular participation by the women of Virginia in elections. The good men of the Virginia General Assembly also enacted legislation that would begin the process of adding an amendment to the Virginia state constitution to allow women to vote if the federal amendment failed. Fortunately, Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment, which then became part of the U.S. Constitution. To handle the numbers of women who rushed to register to vote, some localities deputized women as officers of election to speed registration. Women formed motor corps to shuttle housewives and working women to register. The Virginia Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage now urged its members to register to vote to offset ballots that would be cast by African-American women. The Equal Suffrage League of Virginia reorganized as the League of Women Voters in Virginia on November 10, 1920. Like its predecessor organization, the League of Women Voters did not welcome African-American women until the 1960s. Registration was fraught with confusion, apprehension, and obfuscation. Some registrars resigned rather than register women, and some women were horrified to learn they had to tell their age. 
The University of Virginia's Extension Bureau organized a school of citizenship to teach women how government worked and how to cast a ballot. The process to register was an ordeal. Women had to pay a poll tax of $1.50 and then take the receipt to the registrar who, if he was in a rural area, might keep irregular hours or open his office for only a couple of hours a day. Registrars often provided white women with printed forms to complete, but African-American women had to memorize the required information and fill out blank paper. In Virginia, the registrar kept separate registers of voters who qualified, white and black men, black and white women. These registers are fascinating because they list the voters' age, name, address, occupation. Maggie Walker, who was the first black woman president of a bank, registered on September 14, 1920. And Lila Mead Valentine, the longtime leader of the Equal Suffrage League, registered on September 27. Lucy Christian Scott wrote on the back of her registration oath that she was born on October 29, 1876. She was 44 years old and worked as an embalmer. She lived at 1015 St. James Street in Richmond. She concluded, quote, I have never voted. The Alexandria Gazette reported that by October 4th, 1920, the 1,400 women who had registered accounted for half of the qualified voters in Alexandria. During the campaign for suffrage, African-American women advocated women's suffrage, but quietly, mostly through their women's clubs. After ratification, African-American women lined up to register and face the grim reality of the literacy test in addition to the poll tax. There were no set questions mandated by the state constitution or state law. The registrar could ask whatever questions he wanted to. In Norfolk, the registrar ruled that five African-American women, including Emma Kelly, failed to answer his questions correctly and therefore could not register. The women sued. The judge put the same questions to the registrar who humiliated himself by not being able to answer the questions. The women won and were in fact able to register and vote. November 2nd, 1920, election day, and Virginia women cast their ballots for the first time. Newspaper accounts noted that the day was generally quiet. A Fredericksburg paper reported that, quote, the women took to voting just as a duck takes to water and look like old veterans. In Hampton, quote, the line of voters was kept up all day as the women were out in full to cast their ballots. In Danville, women were the first in line. Men and women of both races stood in line together and that did offend some people. One Newport News lawyer complained that, quote, it is intensely disagreeable for our wives and daughters to have to stand in a long line of white and colored men and women before they can proceed to vote. A Martinsville woman gave her husband marching orders that morning. Put on your collar and your coat, she instructed him. This is a day of triumph and dignity. Generally, white women voted for Democratic candidates. The Democratic Party in Virginia at the time was the dominant political party. It was more conservative and dedicated to white supremacy. African Americans generally voted Republican and then which was the more uh, progressive party. Some women such as Elizabeth Lewis Odie, as you see her here, voted for socialist Eugene B. Debs. In 1921, Maggie Walker and Odie both ran for the Superintendent of Public Instruction, which was then a, an elected um, official. The Republican Party in Virginia had split, split into black and white factions in 1920. Odie was the first woman nominated by a, by a major party, the Republican, for statewide office, and she ran on what was called the Lily White Republican ticket. Black Republicans developed their own ticket, the Lily Black ticket on which Walker ran. Both women lost to the Democratic opponent. So beyond voting, how did woman suffrage affect Virginia's women? Virginia women had some success in having enacted legislation that concerned them most in education, health, and labor. Between 1924 and 1933, six women ran successfully for seats in the Virginia House of Delegates. 
The first women elected were Sarah Lee Fain of Norfolk and Helen T. Henderson of Buchanan, Buchanan County, and they served in the 1924 General Assembly. Henderson died in 1924, but her daughter, Helen Ruth Henderson, won her mother's seat in 1928. Fain served three terms before running unsuccessfully in 1934 seat in the U.S. Congress. From 1933 until 1954, no woman served in the House of Delegates, and no woman was elected to the Virginia Senate until 1977. So were the women of the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia and the Virginia branch of the National Women's Party successful? Yes. But we must recognize that the 19th Amendment didn't resolve all problems. Native Americans could not vote because they were not recognized as citizens until 1924. And it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the 24th Amendment that the poll tax was finally done away with. Literacy tests were still used into the 1970s. In 1923, Congress began consideration of an equal rights amendment called the Lucretia Mott Amendment. In 1924, the Virginia House of Delegates Committee on the Courts of Justice sent the amendment to the full House for a vote. Alas, the House defeated the amendment 38 to 20, 39 to 28. But as Marion Reed pointed out in her report to the National Woman's Party, quote, 28 votes in favor of a blanket equal rights bill in the state of Virginia was nevertheless regarded as a long step toward victory. Well, it took a long time, but this past January, the Virginia General Assembly became the 38th state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Our website has so much more information about these remarkable women and this remarkable and fascinating story. Links to biographies of Virginia's suffragists and short gallery talks, and even audios of suffragists' own words read by staff at the library. I hope you'll come down to the library to see the exhibition or visit the traveling exhibition, which is scheduled to be at the Loudoun County Public Library early next year. So thanks for listening. Um, hope You'll see the exhibition uh, either at the library or go to the Fauquier County Historical Society to see their exhibition. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, that was that was awesome. Uh, I definitely have a, a couple questions that I want to sure. ask. Um, and uh, I just want to thank Carol and Jackson for you guys coming. And, you know, it, it also occurs to me that I'm recording this and um, I truly cannot wait to put this out on social media and have people get to to see this and and learn from it um the question that i wanted to ask and carol and, and jackson if you guys want to um to uh either put your question in the chat or come on video and ask a question you're welcome to do that i'm going to take us off of share so that i can see the chat um and make sure that if you guys have that question that i'm seeing it um but i was wondering i think i could i could swear i read this somewhere but i just want to make sure what were the feelings of the ESL towards the um, towards Alice, Par Alice Paul's group, the Progressive uh, <laughs> Women's Party? Was there there had to be a little bit of some tension there, I imagine, because of the different tactics? There was a lot of tension. Part of the problem was because in 1917 the U.S. Uh, went to war, uh, joined the the um, Allied effort um, in World War One, and the National American Women's Suffrage Association and the Equal Suffrage League both said, "Okay, we'll take a step back." We'll work for the war effort and we'll show, we will prove that we're good patriots and we really deserve the suffrage. Um, and Alice Paul and the Congressional Union went, no. Um, this wouldn't be, she started stepping up um, the protest outside the, the, the White House and they were holding banners, taking Wilson's words about democracy abroad and saying, what about democracy at home? Right. And embarrassing him. And so the Equal Suffrage League, I mean, Lolly Mead Valentine just came out just out and just said, we don't know these people. We disavow what they're doing. We think they're wrong in their tactics. Um, wow. Please understand that they do not rep they do not represent a lot of the suffragists who are working for women's suffrage. Yeah. No, that makes that makes sense because I think based on what I read, they were trying to sell themselves as being like the sort of high status social class sort of we're the upstanding members of society. We're not this radical um far out group yeah that they, were, they were they were ladies they were going to treat themselves as ladies it was all by persuasion and education yeah nice. yeah and then um i really wanted to hone in on so 
um, 30,000 members would have made them the largest non-military private organization in the state. Yep. That is absolutely incredible. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'm floored by that because I think I read somewhere that they were the largest suffrage organization in the South. Um, so I, I have that in the exhibit and I've been telling people that, but uh, did not know that they were the largest private organization, period. Um, so that is that is remarkable. And I guess like, I'm wondering if when they came to Fakir, it seems that people really just flocked to them and the, the moment was ripe for them to come and, and try to form these committees. Does that, does that show in, in other counties in Virginia, wherever they went, people were, were showing that the time was now for women's suffrage and it just needed a group like them? It does, and I have to agree with Brent. I think you need to look at suffrage not as sort of an outlier and there was a suffrage movement and that was all there was to it. Yeah. This is all part of the reform movements that crop up in the late 19th and early 20th century where women begin to go outside of their traditional social roles right. and they take um, an active interest and, and actively participate in pushing the agendas for prohibition, uh, for women's suffrage, for reforming health and particularly labor laws as it affected at, um, uh, working women and child labor. Um, so when you when you look at all of that, then it begins to make sense why there were there were members of the Virginia opposed woman suffrage, um, members of you know Jane Rutherford and people like that, who knew uh, Lolly and Valentine, and probably at some point you know they were, may have been friends mm. because of suffrage. I'm not sure how friendly they were afterward, but yeah. but uh, you know these women all worked in different uh, reform movements, so there there's overlap. Uh, which I think is really interesting. And that's something I think really has not been looked at in terms of the, the Virginia reform movements. Um, but it is remarkable that the ESL um, by 19, 1919 was the largest private organization in the Commonwealth at that time. Um, you know, and it's all run by, by women. Uh, and these are women, you have to realize there were, there were working women who were involved. We don't know enough about their role. We know very little really about the role of African-American women um, because the records, um, we don't know where, if, if the records of the women's clubs uh, uh, survive, if they do, they really haven't been looked at. They don't, they haven't turned up in Virginia. We're hoping that some of those will, in the next couple of years, some of that material will pop up because it's obvious that uh, from what little we know that the African-American women through the National Colored Women's, the Federation colored women's clubs, they're obviously talking about suffrage. They understand um, the power of the vote. Um, and, you know, they're going to do what they can do within their communities um, to convince women that this is a good thing. And it is interesting that in 1920, when during the registration period, um, that there is a little bit, at least in Richmond, there's a little bit of um, uh, the two groups the Equal Suffrage League and the African American suffragists sort of come together to make sure that, because the larger goal is to get women to register. Right. Um, okay. So it's, you know, there is there are these little moments like that. We wow. do know that, you know, the national, uh, the, the NAACP, which was established about 1908 or 1910, 19, yeah, about that time period, had not been around that long, actually sent um, observers down into the Tidewater area to make sure that women were able to register. And this is how we know about the lawsuit from that involved Emma Kelly in, uh, in Norfolk, which is just a great story. And I've, oh my I, God. You, know, you have to feel kind of, kind of sorry for the, uh, the registrar who <laughs> this, you know, looked like a total fool. What a moment, um, what a yeah, moment. Really. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was, you know, it's now, Things like that are extremely rare, but um, yeah. Yeah. they are sort of moments to, I think, celebrate. And yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's know. important to note that maybe that's the exception to the rule that they actually won their case. But yes. it was, but the part that was most common was that a registrar could do that on a whim at any given moment. So the the rare part is that they would win in a suit like that, or that they would even sue to begin with and, and put yeah. their lives at risk to do that. Um, so the, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask, there's, there's a lot of stuff, but the, but one specific thing I wanted to ask about the, um, the index cards that you had in the presentation for yeah. Fox County, I, are those, um, are those on the, uh, the transcribe, um, no, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See, okay. I thought we'd miss it. I was like, oh my God, 
<laughs> incredible. Those are incredible. No, it, that really would have been very difficult to do. Um, yeah, yeah. No, but they all have been digitized. They are. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you want, if you want images, I can get those to you. But they are. Uh, the Senate cards don't have a whole lot of information, but the House of Delegate cards, oh yeah, you know, they, some of these, they, in 1912, when, it, for when the suffrage amendment first comes up, you know, some of those guys are there. Um, and I love, you know, Tiffany who just says, no, I'm not, you know, basically I'm not going to change my mind. Leave me alone. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and what's also interesting I found out is that he, um, he had a stroke um, and died in March of 1920. Oh and, my God. <laughs> And I thought, well, you know, kind of serves you right. But anyway, I mean, yeah, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. But, but, is, um, wow, but you know, it's it's yeah. you know, you read some of the comments that the women make about um, their their conversations with these legislators. Yeah. You know, the ones who are for suffrage. You know, it's like, thank God we have these people on our side. Yeah. But some of them, some of them, like Wilbur Hall, is like, well, you know, he really wants to, and yeah. Then you know, he's like, he's waffling and he's flip flopping, and so flip flopping is nothing new. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's just, remarkable. I would love to vote for suffrage, but my wife says no, or my mother says no. And all I can say is thank goodness for Harry Burns in Tennessee, whose <laughs> mother told him to vote for. Um, yes. So I was going to ask if that's, so that's, I've heard that story and it is true. We, we know that that's true. That, that, oh my gosh. Okay. She, wow. she said she, he was going to, he was going to vote against. He had on his, um, his red rose, or I think is what it was. And uh, his mother had given him a note and basically said, you will vote for woman <laughs> suffrage. Awesome. And he did. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, that, and that one vote sent it over the top. And then yeah. of course that was on August 18th, 1920. And then on the 26th, yeah. the, um, the, the vote was certified, certified and the 19th Amendment became part of the U.S. Constitution. And so it doesn't, it didn't, it didn't override um, eligibility. State law still determined who was eligible and what laws you could you could put in to enforce right. to uh, determine who could actually register to vote. Um, but it does say that, you know, the 19th Amendment says that on the count of sex, you cannot deny the right to vote. Um, I think that was, uh, we, we mentioned that in the exhibit that mm -hmm. one of the unfortunate arguments made by the ESL, whether by expediency or by, I mean, for, for both reasons, expediency and just straight up racism, I think, but, um, but they, they made the, the case that, look, you know, it's not going to affect white supremacy because these state laws are still in place. And so, you know, right. you don't have to worry about, um, about white supremacy being challenged in Virginia, at least, um, which, you know, is uh, just seeing the words there, like they're, they're arguing like, yeah, we don't worry about white supremacy. The words white supremacy are written right there. It's, um, it's something else. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like the broadside that it should, you know, Virginia warns its citizens. Um, that was yeah. a broadside that was published by the Virginia Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage. And they went through, uh, looked at population uh, for certain counties in Virginia and where, you know, the, the majority population was, uh, was black. And they said, you know, if these people can vote, they're going to revert to uh, black rule. And you know, how, why, how terrible was that after the Civil right. War? Well, actually, it wasn't that bad. Right. Um, but it, it was that kind of, it was playing on the fear. Um, yeah. And it just, it's, uh, it's, it's an ugly part of the story, but we, we knew that we had to address that. And um, insofar as we were able to do that, yeah. Yeah, same, same here. And, and it's amazing, like I didn't, learning about this movement, I didn't know too much about the um, women's suffrage movement in Virginia. And it just, I'm much more, I, I focus a lot on the Civil War in college um, mm -hmm. and a little bit of, of afterwards. And it was amazing to see that, that black rule uh, fear come up again. You know, it's just so often, in American history, especially in Virginia and in Southern states, that is just that was used as a bludgeon against um, against progressive movement. The idea that they were terrified that um, that black people would rule over them. And uh, but it's also the language. If you look at the what the antis were saying that you know the women it, women suffrage was you know socialist and it would destroy right. the home and all this that and the other. And when 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 we opened the exhibition um, in January, it was interesting having some people come through and read that and go. Hmm. I heard that in the 1970s when I was marching for women's women's <laughs> rights. And it's like, oh yeah, the language does not change. Right. Um, no. Anytime women step outside and and push for a right, 
um, or a cause, you know, this is what's thrown up at them. You know, it defeminizes them. Right. Um, and it's, you know, they shouldn't be doing this because it's, you know, it, it would destroy the home. They're, they're unfeminine or something like that. And it's, um, it's, it's really, it's sad that, that, that gets, that gets thrown up every single solitary time. Every time. Um, just one quick last question and then I'll let you go. And, and I think uh, Carol and Jackson, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, Carol, I see you on mics. Did you have a question or um, did, is that just, uh, are you unmuted? Did you have a question for us? Yes. Awesome. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. can. Um, yeah. uh, maybe and I missed it, but when, what did the, um, uh, what happened to the ESL? Did it just mm. peter out? No, um, the ESL was very much, was very active right through um, October, um, or actually right through um, Election Day, uh, November 2nd, 19, 1920. And then right after that, uh, sort of disbanded and immediately, and I do mean immediately that afternoon, reorganized as the League of Women Voters, Virginia wow. branch. Okay. So the League of Women Voters is this year celebrating its also its centennial. Right. Um, so they're very active in uh, getting people to register and getting people to vote. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you guys, we have a, um, and Jackson has well, a question. Thank, you for, thank yeah. you for that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We, there's a uh, League of and Women I, Voters. I am. Oh, please go ahead. <clears throat> I am the president. I am the president of the League of Women Voters. Yay! Oh my gosh, Carol, Carol, thank, okay, thank and I, you. I wanted to thank you for that. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, very exciting to hear you. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, it looks like Jackson has two questions. Uh, okay. Oh, that's great questions. Um, what was your favorite part of this research and what was your biggest challenge with it? Oh, the favorite part. Oh my gosh, that's so hard to imagine. Um, hmm. Great. I think the favorite part was uh, was learning about the Congressional Union uh, for Women's Suffrage, the uh, the group that became the National Women's Party, um, because we didn't we knew we had seen the name, but we really didn't know anything about the members. Um, and once we got the minute book, thank you, Posey Cowan, um, going through that and reading about their activities and the we we got names of women who didn't, we didn't know to look for them, frankly, like Maude Jameson and, um, uh, and it's just a great story. And Marion Reed, I was telling uh, Sean before we got started, uh, reading about Marion Reed and doing some, some background uh, work on her and actually wrote her biography for on our website. She and her sister-in-law founded the first Girl Scout troop in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Awesome. Troop number one, Pansy Troop uh, in Highland Springs, That's and I think it's still around. Um, so she was involved. Who knew to even look at something like that? Right. Um, and what happens is that when, by the time so many of these women die, and Marion, for example, died in 1972, um, their, their role in suffrage, in the suffrage movement, have been sort of forgotten. So it tends not to be included in their obituaries. And again, in the case of Marion, she didn't have children, so you know, there wasn't that much information. But um, the nice thing about this project is that we've been able to recognize the role and the, the enormous output of energy on the part of these women. They had a goal, they had a cause, they were going to achieve it after 10 years. They were, I mean, they really, really did this. Um, and they deserve a lot of credit. Um, uh, and this was a chance to sort of, you know, tip the hat to these ladies. And when I voted, I did vote early because I have to, I'm an officer of election in the city of Richmond. Oh, cool. um, you know, I, I had, I, when I vote, I stand on, on their shoulders. They, they really paved the way. The biggest challenge, I think it still remains the challenge, and that's, what did the African-American women do? What did they think? What did they write? How did they, um, how did they approach talking about women's suffrage? We know that in 1920, in, I think it's in Roanoke, they form, a group there forms the, uh, the Colored Republican Party um, uh, or committee. And they're obviously out there, you know, canvassing for their, their Republican um, uh, candidates. So we would like to know a lot more about that. Um, 
but it's, and it's sort of the thing that, you know, every time Mary, Brent and I give talks, uh, we're always finding something out, something new that we didn't know. That's the best part of the job, I think. Mm. Um, and, and so it's, the research hasn't ended. It's just going to continue, maybe not quite at the same pace, um, but there's still a lot of great information out there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. This has been uh, everything I hoped for. Um, I uh, just wanted to say to Carol and Jackson, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Um, and uh, just a quick plug that we're next in November, November 14th, we have uh, Dr. Kelly Dietz coming to give a talk on uh, Bound to the Fire, how in, uh, Virginia's enslaved cooks helped create American cuisine. And we're just gonna keep doing, I mean, look, I, with Barbara, Barbara was the greatest example of like, you can just reach out to an incredible expert on a topic. And in our, in our coronavirus era where people are doing virtual, they will come and do it for you. So I'm gonna really shoot for the stars here. And, uh, and, and Barbara's an example of that. Kelly Deeds is an example of that. And we're just gonna keep rolling with these amazing speakers. So please keep coming out and supporting it. Um, and uh, just, yeah, thank you guys for coming, so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. This is this has been a great experience. Thank Good. You. Really thank you, glad. Carol. Thank you so much. A absolutely. And actually, I want to um, get in contact yeah. with you at some point uh, in the League of Women Voters. So I'll um, I'll have to e now that I have your email, we can definitely talk. And um, thank you for coming out. Absolutely. Bye, thank you so much. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay. All right. Okay. Wow. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I'm going to let you go, but uh, real quick, I, I would, I'll email you, but I would love to, um, if you have a file on those index cards that you had in the presentation, um, if you could send those my way, that'd be amazing. And yeah, uh, if you want to send me a reminder, because between now and Tuesday, sure. I'll probably forget. <laughs> I, will, I will definitely do. I'll shoot you an email later today. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. Really appreciate this. And I'm going to put it up on Facebook. Is that okay if I do that? that that's fine with me. Amazing. Okay. Right. Thank you, Sean. Bye. Bye.